Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Our, our author talks are hosted by the uh, Friends of the Library. And today we have Angie Heitch, uh, owner of Ship Shape Solutions, to talk about her new book, Unholy Mess. Going to tell us all kinds of things about organizing. And uh, stick around because we're going to have a drawing for a free copy of the book. So Angie, if you'd like to take it away, thanks for being here. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk about the book, to talk about organizing in any aspect, and to talk about God and faith and how all these things work together. So I'm going to start by just reading the opening paragraph of the book because it kind of is a good preview of what to expect in the book and also what we'll be talking about tonight. So my goal is that we're going to um, I'm going to give you a little feel of what the book has in it. Um, just an, an overall flavor for it and a few highlights and with scripture and then some practical tips that you can use in organizing your home or whatever space uh, and also your mind and your schedule. So opening paragraph of the book, we live in a culture of abundance. Most of us have the financial means to obtain every possession we need and much more. We have a full selection of activities from which to choose. We own devices that can help us find information, be entertained and stay connected to friends and family at all times. But our abundance is both a blessing and a curse. We've filled our homes and our lives to overflowing. We've lost sight of what truly matters while chasing an ever elusive sense of contentment. So what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to start uh, the goal of the book and the goal of a little bit of what I'm going to preview tonight. We're going to kind of take an honest look at ourselves, our homes, our lives, uh, and identify any clutter that we might find. And then to come up with both the motivation and a plan to um, to get rid of that clutter. So that's my overall goal of the book. And the ultimate overall goal is that by getting rid of things that distract us, we can focus on the most important things. And that would be in our relationship with God. So um, what we're gonna talk about tonight, um, I'm gonna do just a little bit of what I call clutter 101. We're gonna talk about uh, just the basic definition of what is clutter, and then the three types, uh, physical clutter, schedule clutter, and attention clutter. And for each of those types, I'm gonna give kind of a basic definition, some of the consequences, then the biblical principles, including some scripture, and then some practical tips and solutions. I wanna make sure to leave some time for questions and answers, and then we're gonna do a drawing for a free copy of the book. So, Clutter 101. So most of us, when you think about clutter, we usually think about our stuff. Piles of stuff in some kind of less than ideal state. Piles up, it gets in our way, costs us time and money. Um, but as you'll find out in this book, clutter goes a whole lot deeper than just our stuff. So, I love this more broad definition of clutter because that's how you can see that it really is more about more than our stuff. It is anything that distracts us from what we want and need to do. So our stuff can definitely distract us, but there are other things besides our stuff that are, uh, that are big distractions and just as uh, have just as big a consequences and actually probably even more. So another way to phrase that definition of clutter, anything that distracts us from what we want and need to do, um, it's not just stuff. And as I said, we're gonna talk about physical clutter, schedule clutter, and attention clutter. Um, and the consequences of the schedule and attention clutter, which are the more insidious because they're hidden for in some ways um, but like i said consequences are just as serious probably more so so we'll talk by talking uh, start by talking about physical clutter 
So any possession that you don't love and use or that doesn't contribute to your goals and priorities is clutter. Um, it, when you think of the average house in America has about 300,000 items. Um, and many, many of those 300,000 items are not something that is loved and used and contributes to your goals and priorities. So um, all of us, myself included, probably have some clutter in our homes. So there's lots and lots of consequences of clutter. Some of these I see every time I work with a client. Some of them I just found on doing some more research and some of these were surprising to me. So I'm wondering if some of these you would, uh, would have been surprised to find out. We all think about the waste of time and money, wasted time in, in the sense of uh, you waste time looking for things because you can't find them. You waste money, a lot of times you go and buy something that you already had, but you couldn't find it because you had so much clutter. Um, overwhelm, uh, probably the number one thing that people say when they call me because they need help is, I am so overwhelmed with my stuff. I don't even know where to start. Um, there's a link and there's research, uh, shows a link between clutter and depression, um, clutter and excess weight. Um, the embarrassment and isolation, this is very common where people will say, I can't have anyone in my home because I'm embarrassed by the way it looks. And sometimes that very embarrassment will cause them to uh, not even want to call for help because they're ashamed. Uh, difficulty focusing, this kind of makes sense if you've got just so much stuff around, our eyes don't even know where to, where to land. So it makes it difficult to focus. Um, our home doesn't feel quite so homey when there's a lot of clutter everywhere. Uh, this one surprised me. Uh, children that are in cluttered environments have decreased academic performance um, and increased risk of fire and increased risk of fall. Um, when I work in clients' homes, and I'm, I'm pretty agile and in decent shape and I get injured myself. Uh, just from trying to step around clutter, trying to pull clutter off top shelves, that kind of thing. So uh, all of these are consequences, some of the consequences of clutter. So let's talk about a few scriptural principles and how what the Bible has to say about it. So I love this verse in Psalms 89. The heavens are yours, the earth is yours, everything in the world is yours, you created it all. So we talk about our possessions and our belongings. But in reality, the things that we think we own, they're really God's and they have just been given to us for a short period of time. So they don't belong to us, really. We are simply stewards of the things that God gives us. So when we're given something, we have a responsibility to use it in a way that the owner would want us to use it. So a good steward of possessions takes care of them and is willing to share them if it's something they're not using. So everything we have is from God, and as such, we should use them in a way that glorifies him and that is helpful. Another scripture for this one um, from 1 Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Um, when I'm in a home that has a lot of clutter and I think about the boxes and bins and baskets and bags of, of things that are not being used, it, it's sad to me that there are so many things there that someone could be putting to good use, but they're not being used. Um, so a good steward of possessions would be see that, recognize that those things are not being used, someone else could put good use to them and be willing to share them. All right, let's go to a few practical tips and solutions for the physical clutter. Um, so I like to break organizing down into three simple steps. And these same steps you could use for organizing a kitchen, a bathroom, an office, a schedule, um, a garage, really anywhere. So declutter, arrange, 
maintain. Super easy. Declutter, the first one, is letting go of anything that's unnecessary. This is the most important step. It's the one that people don't really want to do because it requires making some tough decisions. Um, but it is absolutely the most important one. In fact, if you never did anything besides just the decluttering step, it would make a world of difference. So declutter, declutter, declutter. I can't emphasize it enough. So the one that people like to do the most is the arranging because it's the most fun because they want to buy some new bins or baskets or boxes, matching things and put labels. And I love all that stuff. I love to go to the container store. They've got so many options. But if you don't declutter first and you just buy some new containers, you're just shifting clutter around. You're not really organizing. Besides, you don't know how, what kind of containers or size or type or any of that until you get rid of what you don't need. Then you see how much you have left and then you can make your decisions about how to arrange things. So arranging, putting the remaining items in order after you've decluttered, it's the most fun step. And then maintaining, this is the most difficult step because um, it's not uncommon for people to kind of get on this, this uh, organizing frenzy. They get rid of stuff, they get their containers and they label and they get it looking awesome. And then they don't make a plan for how to keep it that way. So that's something that have to, has to be kept in mind from the very beginning. Now that it's in order, how am I gonna keep it that way? So declutter, arrange, maintain, just three basic steps of organizing anything. All right, so if you're thinking about the declutter part of it, and you say, if you're looking at an item and thinking, okay, should I keep it or should I not? I like to break it down to two very easy questions. Do I love it and do I use it? And if you can't answer with a solid resounding yes to both of those, it is clutter. So, uh, and you may say, so if, if the answer to both of those is yes, I love this, I use it. Well, that's easy. That's something you should keep. If the answer to both of those is no, I don't love it, I don't use it. Well, that's easy too. Why is it in your house or in your office? That's easy, let it go. It's when the answer to one is yes and the other is no, that it gets a little more difficult. Um, and you have to start thinking about, okay, I use it, but I only use it like once every five years. So is there something else I could use for this same purpose? Or can I borrow it from the neighbor? Or, um, But I really think that we in general need so much decluttering that if you can't say a big yes to both of those, it is fair game to let it go. All right, and this is probably of all the principles of organizing, this is the absolute most important one. Everything needs a home. Every item in your house or you're in your office needs to have a place that it belongs and it's, it's in its home if it's not being used. And then when you take it out to use it and then you use it, it was returned to his home. It should have one home. There shouldn't be like five homes for batteries around the house or flashlights or whatever, some of these condoms items without a home. Ideally, you would have the home close to the place where it's used. Everybody that lives there should know where the home is. And then once it's not finished being used, it gets returned. Now that's in an ideal world um, that as soon as you finish using it, you put it back. Well, Sometimes you don't have time, it gets put somewhere temporarily, and that's real life. But the real mark of an organized space is not, is it organized all the time? That's unrealistic because, you know, we've got our lives to live and things happen and our schedules get busy and emergencies happen. But the real mark of an organized space is when it gets out of order, as it will, how quickly can order be reestablished? And if items have homes, that's a big, big part of um, staying organized. So if you just decluttered and found homes for everything, you'd be making huge progress. So we're gonna move on to the second kind of clutter, schedule clutter. So when I talk about schedule clutter, I'm talking about a calendar or a to-do list that is packed with activity 
that keeps you from spending time on what's important, most important, and doesn't align with your priorities. So your schedule would be your calendar and your to-do list. So again, clutter, broad definition, um, anything that distracts you from what you want and need to do. So when we talk about our time, I love organizing anything, and I think it's great to organize everything, but of all the things that we organize, organizing our time is the most significant organizing. It is the most important thing to organize. You know, and we're kind of a culture of the busy, and it's almost like we see being busy as a badge of honor. Like, I've got a cram-packed schedule. I must be really important because everybody needs me. I've got so much on my calendar. Um, I, I have been guilty of that, and if I don't watch it, I just fall right back in that trap. Um, like the more I've got to do, the more important I must be. Or sometimes, honestly, I would fill my schedule and my to-do list stuff so full because I didn't want to take the time to reflect on what are my actual priorities and does my life actually match up? So it's kind of a trap. And I would encourage you not to fall in it. All right, so, you know, with the physical clutter, we talked about how the things we own, we don't really own. They're really God's. He just gave them to us for a while. Well, it's the same thing with our time. Our time is a gift from God. So if we're going to be good stewards of our time, we're going to use them in a way that glorifies God. So one of the, one of the scriptures that I think teaches this really well is the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, if you're... Uh, a student of the Bible, this is probably a familiar story. Uh, a Jew had been robbed and beaten and left for dead. And several people walked by, this is in Luke 10, um, seeing him and seeing what kind of condition he was in um, and just walked on by and did nothing for him. And then the good Samaritan, and the reason this was so important was because Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Samaritan would never think to stop for a Jew. And this, the Good Samaritan, he didn't consider his time or his money his own because he was willing to share it. Um, and I'm confident that all the people, Samaritan included, that saw this Jew in his situation had things on their to-do list and items on their calendar, but they set those aside in order to help out. So when we're good stewards of our time, we use them in a way that glorifies God. So what can we do about if we think we've got some schedule clutter? Um, well, you need to carefully examine everything on your calendar and your to-do list and see if it matches your priorities. Well, this takes knowing what your priorities are. You need to take some time to reflect. And it's easy to say that God and my family are the most important things, but if somebody looked at your calendar and your to-do list, would they know that? If they watched you the way you live, would they know that? So making sure those things match what your true priorities are. Um, to-do lists. I'm a huge fan of to-do lists. I probably, I, I, I'm, I should ask my mom. I bet I had a to-do list when I was like five or something. Um, but sometimes I can be just so enslaved by my to-do list. I just queen of productivity, just like, what could I get done? What could I get done? And I have a hard time relaxing. Um, someone told me one time, and I thought this was great advice. I, I get so obsessed with getting things done on my to-do list, and I get all excited. like, Oh, yes, did it. Mark it out. Mark it out. I would write it just so I could mark it out because I get all excited. But then, of course, things keep getting added. So it's like a roll of paper towels. You pull one out. I mean, it's just that's the nature of the to-do list. It's just, there are things that are going to keep getting added. So you can't be enslaved by it. And you got to make sure the things on there match your priorities. Um, I will tell you something practical on to-do list that's been a real game changer for me. And whether you like digital to-do lists like I do, or you're a paper person, it's whatever works for you is fine. But I like having two lists, a master list that's kind of in order of priority with all my things on it. But then for one day, I'll have just a small like one, two or three things. These are the things I'm going to do today. And then my master list is somewhere else. So I don't have to be looking at it and thinking, 
oh, this is great. I got this today, but I still got 52 things on there. So a master and a small daily list helps me a lot. Okay. Um, if you're like a lot of people, you have too many things on your calendar because you say yes to everything. Um, this is very common um, for someone to say yes to something they don't really want to do it, but this person kind of needed help and oh, and I'll feel so guilty if I don't do it. So I like the idea that I got from Emily P. Freeman, who's an author and podcaster. Her podcast, The Next Right Thing, is one of my favorites. She says it's a great idea to have a no mentor. What a no mentor does, it's got to be someone that knows you really well, knows your strengths, knows your weaknesses, knows what you, that you tend to say yes to too many things. And when you're presented with an opportunity, instead of just immediately saying yes, like you're used to, if you're one that overcommits, then you say, okay, let me think about it. I'll get back to you and then go talk to your no mentor. If your no mentor knows you really well, they'll help you decide like sometimes, yeah, that's a great opportunity. You should do that. You'd be good. You'd be good at it. And I think you'd enjoy it. And I think you have time. Yeah, that's a yes. But if your schedule is too full or it's really not something you have time for, they'll help you make that no decision when you ha might have a hard time with it. So a no mentor. If you don't have one, get one. That's a line from Toy Story. All right. Attention clutter. All right. So this is one that I don't know that I was really on my radar for a long time. In fact, um, when I started working with clients and was going into homes that had a lot of physical clutter, I would come home and say, oh, it's so nice to be home in my uncluttered home. It was kind of a prideful thing. And then the more I read about and thought about and studied about clutter and was willing to take a really honest look at my life, I realized I have a lot of clutter too. It's just kind of invisible. It's not something that most people, unless they know me well, would see. So attention clutter is probably my number one type of clutter. So I define it as, again, we're talking about anything that distracts. So anything that draws your attention away from what's going on at the moment or away from your priorities. You might also call it mental clutter. And how do you know if you have attention clutter? You have difficulty concentrating, you lack focus, and whatever's going on at the time, you may be just in another land, zoned out from that. And <clears throat> why is it so important to pay attention to our thought life? Well, what we pay attention to contributes to what we think about, what we think about, contributes to what we do and shapes the direction of our lives. So it's pretty serious business what we are dwelling on in our minds. So attention clutter is something that is that definitely needs to be addressed. There's a whole lot of things that contribute to attention clutter, but there is one cause that outshines them all in a big way and that is our phones. Uh, I had to finally come face to face with my addiction to my smartphone. And when I talk about these, this issue, I want you to catch yourself if you're thinking, oh yeah, those young people, they're on their phones all the time. I just see them constantly with their nose in their phone. Or, oh yeah, so-and-so really has a problem with that. Oh, you, I want you to be willing to consider that this might actually apply to you no matter what your age or your gender or your uh, life situation. So I'm gonna tell you some smartphone statistics that are pretty eye-opening. The average smartphone owner unlocks their phone 150 times a day. Users spend an average of two hours and 51 minutes a day on their smartphones. In comparison, the quality time people spend with their family it's usually 45 minutes a day or less. 58% of smartphone users don't go an hour without checking their phones. The average user touches their phone 2,617 times every day. 
71% of smartphone users sleep with or next to their phones. 80% of smartphone users check it within an hour of waking or going to sleep. 75% of users admit they've texted at least once while driving. 85% check their device while speaking with friends and family. And I'm telling you, I'm guilty of almost all of these. Probably all. We will spend an average of five years and four months of our lifetimes on social media. That's a lot of time. This was in my book. At the end of our lives, we may say, I really wish I'd spent more time with my family and friends. I don't think anyone will ever say, I wish I'd spent more time on my smartphone. Let's look at a couple of scriptures for this. Romans 12, 2. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are lots of scriptures about how uh, our thought life and how God wants us to watch our thoughts. So the renew and the pattern of this world is that we look at our phone 2,617 times a day. So we need to not conform to that pattern. Another scripture. And if you're wondering like what kinds of thoughts or, you know, you can't have a blank slate in your mind all the time. Your brain is constantly generating thoughts. That's what it does. So how do I know if this thought is a good thought? Is this thought clutter or is it not? Here's a good test. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So that's kind of a litmus test that we can use to see if those thoughts are clutter. All right, I'm gonna give you a few strategies for things you can do if this is an issue for you. And again, um, be willing to consider that it might be. And I would highly encourage you, whether you're an iPhone user or an Android user, there are easy ways for you to check to see how much time you're spending. You can see how many times you unlocked your phone, how many times you touched it, how long you spent on different apps. It's really easy to do. So Google that, find out how to do it, and be willing to look at those numbers. It may really surprise you. So some of the things that I have done to break my addiction, again, it's an ongoing process. I'm not using your phone in the car. It's obvious you don't wanna use it when you're driving because that's dangerous. But even when you're a passenger, um, my husband loves to drive, I don't, and so he's the driver pretty much all the time when the two of us are together. And it used to be that when he was driving, I was on my phone the whole time. Um, not only was it rude because whatever was on the phone was more important than what was him, his was. So I wasn't in the moment, I was in my phone. I wasn't looking around, enjoying any nature, and, and the conversations were not important. My phone was more important, so put your phone down. No phones at meal times. You've probably all been in restaurants and seen either the kids on the phone and the parents not, or just as often the parents on the phone, the kids not. But put your phones down. My husband and I, that's a rule. We don't have it at the phone. We don't have our phones out at the at meal time. And we try, if we go to a restaurant, we try to just leave them in the car. Um, put, do not disturb certain hours. You can limit how many times it dings or buzzes or vibrates. Uh, there's settings for every single thing that makes your phone alert you. But every time that you're doing something, your phone goes off and whatever, you are, that breaks that thought, it breaks whatever's happening, you're out of the moment. Um, this has made a big difference for me. Not charging my phone right beside the bed has been a game changer. It's across the bedroom from me. Um, and you might think, well, what if there's an emergency? Somebody's going to keep trying if they really need to reach you. But that one small thing has made a big difference for me. So other kinds of attention clutter. Um, media is a big source. TV, movies, radio, music, podcasts. I love all those things. 
Um, but just be sure to filter them against God's word and what your priorities are. So um, my book is available on Amazon. There uh, in ebook or paperback, there are two copies at the Kingsport Public Library that I donated. And those are available for checkout. And right now I'm booking presentations with different types of groups, uh, church group, women's group, um, book club, any kind of group, virtual or in person. And I can do a really short presentation, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, or I can do a longer workshop, two to four hours, which has lots more scripture, time for personal reflection, lots of discussion. I use polls so that you can enter answers on your phone. They come up on the screen and uh, very engaging and interactive. And um, so if you're part of a group that needs a speaker, I would love to be able to, to, uh, to talk to you about that. So um, just a couple of things that people have said so far about the book. Um, been an inspiration. This this really makes me happy because I really wrote this book to glorify God and to bring people closer to Him. Feeling more peace in your home, and then the mental clutter is a, a big issue that people are often unaware of. So, I work one on one with clients, either in person or virtually, to help address clutter of all types and make their homes and their lives more peaceful and productive. And I would love to help anyone that needs help with any kind of clutter. So thank you all so much for coming. We are